It is a huge honor today to be interviewing my buddy, Michael Wall, who I think I've known since day one. I think I've known you 25, 30 years. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing well, Howard. How about you? I'm doing very well. And you were my instant hero. It was love at first sight. I think the first time I ever heard about you or anything is uh, we were both, we're, we're the age where we, uh, we rode the cosmetic revolution. And these guys were coming out and they were saying, you know, composites lasted twice as long as amalgam and they were better and they glued the walls together. And I mean, the composites were just like, you know, like God's goo, you know, I mean, it just, it was just perfect stuff. And you were the only guy who wrote the most eloquent article. I think it was published in Dentistry Today or something like that, where you were just sitting there saying, you know, come on, enough with the hype. Amalgams last longer than composites. Amalgams are still... Um, a quality restoration, they last, blah, 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 blah. And uh, you took so much flack from all the cosmetic gurus and everybody was amalgam-free and metal-free. Um, do you remember that article? Uh, well, I wrote a few, actually. And uh, there was one article in two parts that I wrote for Quintessence. And I entitled it Amalgam, Resurrection, and Redemption. And it was particularly addressed to these uh, anti-amalgamists like the ones you're talking about. And I'll, I will say that the argument on longevity, on amalgam longevity, is getting old, you know? Uh, of course, amalgam, in, in all, virtually every study, every big study has shown that amalgam still lasts longer than composite. Now, don't get me wrong. Amalgam is but ugly. And that's why I usually prefer composite, because of the, the cosmetic appearance of it. And composites are certainly improving every day. But yes, uh, as far as which one lasts longer, there there's, a, there's really no contest. Uh, amalgam generally lasts longer than, than composite. Well, hey, I, I have to defend everything that's butt ugly because that's, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm the champion for butt ugly, and I still have four out of four boys. Uh, my boys recommend me as their father. So they're, but but, the, but the, thing, the thing that scares me the most about composites is I've lectured in 50 countries. And can, I, can I tell you a composite story, and I'm not going to tell you, uh, the country it was in or whatever. But uh, so I'm in this uh, very, very poor country. I, I don't like the term third world, you know, you know, because they're uh, they seem to be a lot more happy and giggle than people in, you know, United States and Germany and Korea and Japan. But one of the most lovely societies I've ever been in, but extremely poor. And this dentist wanted to show me that he did this high tech dentistry. So he um, this little beautiful 20 year old woman walks in. She's got a spot on her tooth. So he, um, he drills it and drills it and drills it and drills it and drills it. And uh, he numbed it up and then he drills it and he finally gets it out and I can see the pink. And then he takes the, uh, his, his composite kit and he puts the uh, acid etch on it and uh, she doesn't like the taste. So she uh, spits up and rinses and spits in a bucket. And then he puts on the, uh, the, the, the bonding agent and she doesn't like that taste. So she rinses that off and spits. And then he puts on the, the resin, and then he cures it. And then she rinses and spits again. Then he puts on the composite, cures it. Then she rinses again. And then he spent 25 minutes polishing it until it looked just gorgeous. And I'm just sitting there saying, oh, my God, she came in with a discoloration on a canine. Now she has a pulp exposure and a composite that is, you know, it could, I mean, it was it's just unbelievable. So then the next patient came in, um, different deal. Um, took out an amalgam, put in a composite, and I mean the 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 patient rinsed five times during all the bonding agents. So I mean, so so when we're looking at two million dentists serving seven billion people, I think three billion people live in an area where the dentist could not keep it dry, could not keep it isolated. There's no rubber dam. There's no dental assistant with a with a suction. And when those dentists are reading international internet forms trashing amalgam when these people don't even they, there's no chance of isolation I, and then there's other people in very rich countries trying to ban amalgam and it's like if you banned amalgam about three billion people are going to get horrible dentistry you know what i mean yes yes good point and and they, they 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 follow everything americans say i mean you know when you go to uh south america africa asia i mean you know that well the americans say this the americans say i mean you hear that all the time Right. And, and what they don't understand is, well, in America, an operatory is about $25,000 worth of stuff in it. Yes. And you can't do that in a lawn chair. You know? True, true. But, um, 
Yeah, so so I, I, I still think Amalgam is the champion for the poor. Well, it is, but but even even neglecting that part of the, the argument, and that, that certainly those are good points, if you just look at it, even in this country, you can see that many of the things that the, uh, the so-called anti-amalgamists are asserting are simply false. For example, amalgam can't be bonded to, to teeth. I mean, there are Pitt and Fisher amalgam sealants that are lasting over five years. If that doesn't prove that you can bond amalgam to teeth, I don't know what will. Not only that, but the uh, bond strength, not that bond strength itself is necessarily important, has been shown to be higher than it, than it typically is with composite. And so, uh, you know, you have to extend extension for prevention. That's just not true. You don't have to extend for prevention. You can prepare amalgam restorations exactly the same as you could prepare composite restorations, as I do. I use slot preparations for... Uh, you know, for, for class twos, you can, uh, you don't need any sharp line angles. You don't need any hose or hatchets. And, uh, you know, it's just pretty much almost every single assertion. You can show that the opposite is true of, of these, uh, anti-amalgamists, except for the one, the, ug the, the ugliness, that's true. Amalgam's ugly. But, you know, I, I don't even buy the amalgam ugly because, you know, I'm, I'm a dentist and I, I stare at teeth all the time. I mean, I, I'm, I'm the geek that after a movie, someone will say, oh, what do you think about this actor? And I'm like, is that the one with the space between her two front teeth? You know, I, I didn't know her name and all this kind of stuff. But you know what? I mean, you just don't see molars, especially on men. And I, I had this argument with a dear friend of mine. So a six-year-old boy has an occlusal stick and he numbs it up, places a rubber dam, and puts on an occlusal composite, and his boy is six. No one's ever going to see the top of that molar in his entire life. I mean, he's a man. He's a boy. He's thick. I mean, you don't. Even, when you're talking to me, it looks like I have a denture. I mean, I, I don't even. I don't even show teeth. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, you picked a plastic filling on a six-year-old, and your his dad's a dentist. I mean, if it, why wouldn't you just plug that with a little amalgam? I mean, one's metal. I mean, metal. The other one's plastic. Think of a milk carton. I mean, why, why would a dentist with eight years of college pick an occlusal composite on a six-year-old boy who has his hair matted up, a burger hanging out of his nose? I mean, what, what, what is he going to be, a cosmetic molar model? I mean, come on. I mean, I mean, what, I mean, and I want to ask you, how long do you think that occlusal composite on a six-year-old would last versus an amalgam? Both were done under rubber dam, isolated, well, on average, the amalgam will last longer. Absolutely, yes. But but, but longer is mean, long, longer is a vague word. Are you thinking about an hour, you know an hour longer, a year longer, twice as long? What do what do you think? Significantly thinking? longer, maybe almost twice as long. I I admit I I have an amalgam still that my dad placed when I was eight. It's your still, dad was a dentist. My dad was a dentist. Now yes. your brother's a dentist. Yes. So so it's genetic. There's some recessive gene that they're passed along in your family. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Actually, actually, it's a very interesting deal. I, I, I'd like to write a book on it. I want to call it the nuclear family. When you go to like India and Brazil, I mean, I mean, countries, um, continents like that, countries like that, um, your occupation is more of a family deal. I mean, if you um, like, it's not common at all in India or Brazil to meet a dentist and there's 15, 20 dentists in their family tree. Uh -huh. I mean, they're just they're just born in dentistry. Kevin Coachman, one of the most famous cosmetic dentists on earth. I mean, I think he's got like twenty five dentists in his family. Wow. And, I mean, it's just like my your family does this. You you you're a dental family, and the kids that didn't want to be a dentist became lab techs or dental assistants or ran right. the dental office. I mean, everybody was in dentistry. I it's mean, it's a good profession. Yeah, well, it, it, it's the nuclear family, and it, it's an amazing thing. It's, it's a, you know, a nuclear family where, you know, the whole family, they all live together. They're all in one house. I mean, you can go. I, I met a dentist in India, and I went, went home, and, I mean, his mom and dad were both dentists. His three or four brothers and sisters were. Grandma was like 25 people living in one house, and half of them are dentists. I mean, it's just really, really cool. I mean, they just yeah. eat, live, breathe, and die. So I knew your brother was. I knew your dad was. But, but, but you're, say, you're saying amalgams last about twice as long. Uh, I, I, I'm not exactly sure that it, it depends on the study that you see, but, uh, they could be a, as much as twice as long on average. Again, it's, it's, there's a lot of variation. It depends on, uh, you know, a lot of circumstances on how large it is, how many surfaces, who's placing it, wh what conditions they're placing it under. But, uh, but certainly 
virtually every single large study has shown the same thing. Amalgams last significantly longer than composite. So uh, what I try to do is ask so many questions that probably is about 7,000 individuals. Most everybody listening to these, they're, they're community to work on. Podcasts are just a huge multitasking. That, that's what's unique about podcasts. You know, it used to be online CE, you sat at your desk, you watched a course, you filled out 10 questions, you got AGD, ADA credit. But podcasts have exploded um, because they're multitasking. They're, they're commuting to work right now. So, I, so my job is to ask the questions. I'm trying to estimate what they're wondering. And someone's probably wondering, well, why do they last twice as long? Uh, well, first, too, let me say this. The studies that have been done typically have been with amalgam tying its hand behind its back. In other words, there, it was before some of the newer techniques. Uh, one of the assertions against amalgam is that, uh, that there, it had, it's been the same. It's, it's, la it's been the same over the last hundred years. There have been no changes. Uh, there was a, there's a prominent cosmetic dentist who's made that assertion, that because it's over a hundred years old, it's criminal or something like that. Well, besides the fact that there's lots of things over a hundred years old, I mean, uh, aspirin's over a hundred years old, is still used today. Lots of doctors prescribe aspirin. Uh, the flush toilet is, toilet paper, uh, contact lenses, a whole bunch of things are over 100 years old. It doesn't make them uh, uh, a bad thing. So, uh, but many of these studies have been done showing amalgam lasts like many years, but, but were done before the advent of amalgam bonding, where uh, amal the amalgam was not bonded to the teeth, where the extension for prevention uh, was, was done for these preparations. So uh, now we have uh, amalgam bonding, am uh, restorations are much smaller, they can last even longer, and yet those particular studies were done versus composite, which is, was bonded at the time, and yet amalgam still outlasted the composite. Now, as far as why the amalgam lasts longer than composite, well, there's just every study of, of uh, fractured, you know, people say you put an amalgam in a tooth, you're just, you're just going to wait until it fractures. It, that's just not true. Um, the amalgams uh, that have been done, we look at, uh, at, at our patient's teeth. And until recently, nine out of 10 of their teeth that were, had restorations in them had amalgam in them. Of course, it goes without saying that therefore, when teeth fracture, there's a nine out of 10 chance that the ones with amalgam are gonna be the ones with the, the fracture in them. It's not gonna be the ones with the composite because nine out of 10 of their posterior restorations have amalgam in them, but yet, we, with our blinders on, will only look at the fact that there's a broken tooth and it had amalgam and think, well, this happens all the time. The broken tooth was restored with amalgam, therefore the amalgam caused the fracture. It's simply untrue. Not only that, but many of these uh, restorations that are breaking are older because they have amalgam. Amalgam has been used longer, whereas the composites are more recent. But still, if you look at that, you can see it with fractures, for example that the fracture rate of amalgam uh, restored teeth is about the same as, or maybe a little less than the fracture rate of composite restored teeth. You look at uh, uh, caries, recurrent caries. The most common cause of failure of, of an amalgam restoration is caries. The most common cause of failure of a composite restoration is caries. The most common cause of failure of a gold restoration is caries. It's recurrent caries is a very, a uh, uh, common thing. But if you look at the studies of many, many teeth over many years, the, the recurrent caries rate of amalgam is, is very low. It's lower than that, than that of composite. Exactly why? I don't know. Maybe the amalgam has some type of, uh, of anti-cariogenic uh, <coughs> properties. Uh, we, we look at, um, as I say, uh, uh, the bonding of, of amalgam. That, that is something relatively new. It's only been out for m maybe 20 years. It's in, in common use maybe for the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, but if you look at that, that this has actually improved amalgam dramatically. Yes, composite can be bonded as well. But uh, exactly, like I say, the, the, uh, the reasons why, I don't know. I, I will say that the composite restorations are improving. The gap is narrowing in the uh, the differences between composite and amalgam, but still, if you if you uh, look at what's been happening over the years, uh, amalgam still uh, is going to be a superior restoration as far as clinical uh, functionality. You know, my uh, two older sisters went into the Catholic nunnery, you know, straight out of high school, and they're Catholic nuns, and and I so 
I spent all my time with, I grew up with, you know, going to mass every day and my family's, you know, two Catholic nuns. And then I, I, I went Dennis and, you know, when you, what, say it again. Swear to God. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. My, my two old sisters, I think, I think Mary Kay, I'm 53, Mary Kay's 57. And she's been in, she's been a cloistered Carmelite monk. Uh, I've been a dentist 28 years. She's been a cloistered Carmelite monk for 35 years. The other one became an Immaculate Heart of Mary teaching him. But the deal is, you know, they're, you know, in religion, if you want to believe something, that, that's fine if you don't bother someone else. But I, it, it still amazes me how many dentists went to eight years of college and studied math and calculus and physics, and they, they, they don't want to address gravity in math. They, they want to believe something, almost like a religion. You know, amalgams are bad and evil, and they don't last, and composites. This and, and they just, I mean, it's like, dude, leave your religious mind at home or in church on Sunday. I mean, we're dentists. We're supposed to be a science-based profession. And it still amazes me how many dentists have non-scientific arguments. I mean, go ahead. This is what frustrates me. Because when people are bad-mouthing, no pun intended, they're bad-mouthing amalgam, they're making it look like dentistry is a dangerous profession, that you're, you're risking your health by going to the dentist and having your teeth filled. And uh, when, when silicate cements were replaced by composites, no one tried to assassinate the, the idea of dentists, you know, placing silicate cements. They just gradually fell out of favor and then composite resin replaced them. Uh, and if you look at pretty much anything uh, like that in dentistry or any other profession, it, it, old things go out of favor sometimes and then new things come along and sometimes they're picked up and sometimes they're not. But with amalgam, there's this special thing where these dentists have to just, they have to call people who are placing amalgams criminal or something like that. And they have to make up these false allegations against amalgam and put, and many patients come in, I'm sure you have them too, and they're asking, well, is my health at risk from these amalgams? My God, this amalgam's toxic, isn't it? Well, yes, okay, amalgam is toxic, I'll give you that. Water is toxic too. Do these anti-amalgamists not use water in their, in their practices? 4,000 people a year die of drowning from water. Many people die of water intoxication where they're just drinking too much water. So, a few do. So are we just going to say we should ban water? Of course not. It's, it's the dose, not the, the, uh, not the, the substance itself. But there, it goes along with my uh, wider uh, thesis that dentistry is a very safe profession, much safer than many of the professors are, are teaching us. And it, the idea that, uh, you know, you take, you're having your teeth cleaned and you're at risk of a heart infection, it's just, it's... Yes, there might be a very small risk, but it's absurd. You're much, more, you're much better off having your teeth clean and having health, healthy gums. And it goes along with, you know, oh, my God, you got to stop the anticoagulant because you're having an extraction. Meanwhile, you're going to have a stroke if you stop the, the uh, anticoagulant or a heart attack, and many people have, instead of just going on, keeping on the anticoagulant, having the extraction, and it's an innocuous procedure, and, and, and uh, you'll be fine afterwards. But there's a whole bunch of areas like this. The, the idea that a dental visit can make you pregnant, you know, the only way you're going to get a patient pregnant, Howard, I'm sorry, is by participating in the, in the conception, not because they're antibiotic, <laughs> you prescribed an antibiotic and the, the birth control uh, failed. And it go, these go along with the same idea, that dentistry is a very safe profession, Regardless of what these people say, whether they're anti-amalgamists or some of, of the dental school professors, dentistry is very safe. I mean, my dad, God bless him, he was a great dentist, but he never took a health history in 50 years, and he never killed anyone either. And I'm not advocating not taking health histories. I'm advocating to take a health history. But he didn't, and he never killed a single person. Well, health history, Joe, uh, health, health histories, 90% uh, of the question are a joke anyway. I mean, People ask him, have you ever had, you know, syphilis, gonorrhea, or chlamydia? I mean, these are questions you ask in a bar, not in a dental office. How, right. how can I change my treatment plan if you had chlamydia in college? I mean, <laughs> I mean you know, I, mean, I, I, I go through these health histories with my dentist friends and say, okay, what could this possibly do to your treatment plan? I mean, right. it just, and, and I quit asking about STDs. It was in 1987, and uh, this man was in the front before he came back. He wanted to speak to me privately in my office. I'm like, okay. And he starts going on to this story, and he's about 75, and he almost starts to cry. 
because I had the STD deal of gonorrhea. And he was telling me about how in World War II he had a three-day pass and went to the Philippines. And he's, like, confessing, like, I'm Father Howard, you know, the priest. And I was like, I, I, you don't need to tell me that it's all right. And I, I don't care about 50 years ago. And, uh, my God, I deleted that question. I thought, you know, why am I asking people if they had gonorrhea? You know, I mean, it's yeah. just, it's just, just ludicrous. But I have to tell you that um, there's a lot of dentists with uh, non-critical minds. They they want to believe something, whether it's politics, religion, whatever, and then they carry their politics and religion over to dentistry, and they just start with what they want to believe, and they add backwards. And I've always thought, and, and I I mean I've interviewed 200 people on my podcast. I've always thought you've had the most critical mind I've ever met. I mean you you see through. You know, just everything. I mean, and because the the antibiotics for uh, movable joints. I mean, the research on that is is is, is shaky at best, wouldn't you say? Um, oh, oh like absolutely. Even, even your dad didn't take a medical history for fifty years. He didn't wear gloves either. Everything I've read on the city gloves that your the skin on your finger, intact skin, if you don't have an open cut, is probably a million times a better barrier than that little vinyl plastic glove you put over it. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, we're putting gloves on just so that we feel safe. We're, we're, it makes everyone feel better. Right. But a washed, a washed hand, I mean, our, our skin's been evolving for a billion years to keep us inside and all the bugs, bacteria, viruses, and fungus on the outside. And, I mean, putting some silly glove over, we just do, but it doesn't do anything. Yes. Uh, well, I think that's a good point. One thing nice about gloves, too, though, is it looks good to patients, and it and it does keep your hand cleaner, which is nice. I mean, I used to, I, I was practicing before gloves came, became common, and you get impression material on your hand, so it's nice to, to keep the and, impression and, material. And, and the government, I mean, I mean, um, about, talk, talk more about um, pre-medication for artificial joints. What, what, where is your thinking on that now? Well, um, what, the, what started that was this uh, rabbit study in, uh, in like the early 1980s, and a bunch of rabbits were, uh, they had their joints replaced with artificial elbow joints or something, real small joints. And after they recovered from that surgery, then they were inoculated with, with uh, large doses of, 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 um, uh, of bacteria. And some of them got artificial joint infections. Okay, as a result of that rabbit study, there are dentists who said, okay, therefore we should pre-medicate our artificial joint human patients because uh, they may, are, may be at risk for these artificial joint infections. Well, what they neglected to say is that these rabbits were injected with so much bacteria that over half of them died from the uh, bacterial injection. So they had these massive cases of sepsis. It's totally a non-clinical situation that we would be facing. Uh, in addition, other studies have shown you're much more at risk of dying from the antibiotic, even though it's a very tiny risk. You're, there's a much higher risk, many times higher, than you are of getting an artificial joint infection, which if you do get, it's a terrible thing to have, but chances are good you're not going to die from it. Number three is the antibiotics have never been shown to prevent infection in the first place. So the best studies of artificial valve endocarditis, which is related to, to uh to dentistry, possibly, is, uh, have shown that maybe the antibiotic will prevent the uh, valve infection less than half the time, maybe. But that does not translate over to these uh, artificial joint infections. So another thing, too, is what causes artificial joint infection typically are staphylococci. Staphylococci is generally never found in the mouth, or very rarely found in the mouth at all, as opposed to streptococci. So, uh, there's all kinds of reasons why we should reconsider pre-medicating artificial joint uh, patients. Not to mention the American Dental Association 2015 statement, which basically says there's not really any scientific evidence that, that uh, it's a good idea to pre-medicate these patients. In addition to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons 2012 statement, I think, uh, saying we should reconsider this. So the bottom line is you're better off just not premedicating pe people with uh, artificial joints. Yeah, and 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 it's just it's funny how something will culturally someone will have a bad idea, and then <coughs> it culturally takes roots, and then you you can't you can't shake it ten twenty years later. Yeah, but all apes and monkeys like humans, uh, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, humans, we're all covered with staff on the outside, strep on the inside. I mean that that's the basic monkey ape. 
And I, I found it interesting, like, um, when you look at the studies of um, kids dying from chickenpox, which is why we now give them a vaccine, it's actually not the chickenpox that kills them. It's them scratching it, and they, and they cut into their dermis, and then the staph on the outside gets on the inside, and whenever staph on the outside gets in the inside where it's not supposed to be, that's a problem. Right. And, and many of the cases in the literature in the past, if you go back and look, oh, yeah, well, this person had an artificial joint infection, therefore, and, and had a dental appointment within six months beforehand, therefore, it was the dental appointment that caused it. And you look at the organism, and it's a staphylococcus, and they never did, they never, uh, you know, found out what the flora of, of that person's mouth was. But if you look at most people's flora, there's like no staphylococci in the mouth, generally. And another, another one is, um, um, back to that chicken box deal, you know, lots of uh, dentists, you know, they're always taking their kids in for an ear infection, ear infection. They're turning out that it, um, you can better prevent ear infection by keeping the kid's fingernails uh, trimmed. He's digging in his ear, cutting his ear, bacteria is getting in there. And if you keep the nails short, uh, he's not going to be scratching and cutting the ear skin, letting a uh, uh, staff in there. So, uh, so what, what were your, your, you have thoughts on local anesthetics too. What, what's your, what's your thinking on locals? Well, uh, again, people First think of, that, and I want you to know that I'm a high class guy. I don't use any local anesthetics. Mine are all foreign imports, mostly from France. That's funny. Good. Uh, yes. So, uh, with local anesthetics, typically a lot of dentists um, think, well, whatever the newer one is, that's the one I'm going to use. So I want to use Articane because it's newer. And it's kind of like with amalgam. It happens that lidocaine is, uh, has been around since 1948 or something. It is probably the safest local anesthetic. I would recommend, even though they're all pretty safe, I would recommend lidocaine with 1 to 100,000 epinephrine. You can give the most of it before an overdose, because that is one thing that's not a myth. You can give too much local anesthetic, especially to very young children. You can, there have been many cases in the literature of, of overdoses of local anesthetic where people have actually died. I mean, you got to give a lot, but still, with lidocaine with 1 to 100,000 epinephrine, you can give twice as much lidocaine over a short period of time as you can give uh, uh, Articaine. Now, now, Articaine is, um, the, the popular brand name would be Septicaine. Yes, that's so, right. So, Articaine's the, the generic chemical name and Articaine's the brand name? That's right, okay. yes. Uh, Articaine, I'm sorry, Articaine is the generic name, Septicaine is the, is the brand name, yes. Yeah. So, uh, and there's, it's, I'm not saying it's a bad anesthetic or anything, but why would you want to give one that you don't, you, you don't, you know, you can give twice as much with lidocaine. Now, granted, articaine has twice as much concentration, and that's one reason why studies have shown that articaine has a higher rate of paresthesia. Uh, you're, it, again, it's not, it's not a very common thing, but it, there are cases of uh, paresthesia, a higher incidence of paresthesia with articaine than with lidocaine. And there have been other, uh, if you look at the package inserts, they, they never change those package inserts, and those package inserts are not based on scientific evidence, but they might say, oh, well, there's a, you know, a, a risk of malignant hyperthermia if you use uh, lidocaine or something like that. Well, uh, the, the malignant hyperthermia, if you look at it, there was a, these <laughs> studies on pigs where these malignant hyperthermic pigs where they gave them a whole bunch of, uh, of amid local anesthetics like lidocaine, and uh, basically, they saw that, that there was no malignant hyperthermic response, no matter how much. They gave massive quantities of this, these uh, amid local anesthetics like lidocaine. But they did find that after all that, the pigs were very numb. So the bottom line is you don't have to worry about malignant hyperthermia. Uh, similarly, with uh, uh, the interaction with MAO inhibitors uh, uh, and epinephrine, you have to give massive quantities of epinephrine, which, which luckily has a very short half-life. Bottom line is lidocaine with 100,000 epinephrine is very safe. It's uh, other than the overdose possibility, you have to give 14 cartridges to a 160 pound adult. So that's, that's a lot of lidocaine for an adult. With a child, a, a 50 pound child, you, ha you, you can give maybe four or five cartridges. So it, that's a much higher risk. Uh, but other than that, there's really, it's lo local anesthetics and vasoconstrictors are very safe. People say they're allergic to local anesthetics Generally, it's just, it's just false. I mean, there was a local anesthetic that people were allergic to. It was called Procaine. That was the generic name. The brand name was Novocaine. That's the word we sometimes use. We shouldn't. But Novocaine was a brand name for Procaine. That one had a fairly high uh, aller allergenic uh, potential. 
no one in the United States that I know uses Novocaine or Procaine. It's uh, not even uh, manufactured or sold. It may be sold in the United States, I don't know. But all the other anesthetics that are in use are amid local anesthetics. And it's highly unlikely anyone's truly allergic to it. If you ask them, uh, you know, what happened, maybe they'll say, my heart beat fast or something. That is not a sign of allergy. It might be a sign of an intravascular injection uh, of, of a vasoconstrictor, but it's not a sign of allergy. Another uh, myth I'd like to address is, uh, is that somehow Mepivacaine, or Carbacaine is the brand name, is safer than Lidocaine. I don't know why people think that. It's simply not true. Uh, lidocaine in pregnant women, for example, lidocaine is a category B. It's probably safe. Uh, Mepivacaine is category C. We, no one knows for sure. It's probably safe too, but no one knows. It's, it's actually in a lesser category. Uh, the, the vasoconstrictor that is used with carbocaine is levonorgestrel. That is a more dangerous vasoconstrictor than epinephrine. Epinephrine is produced by our bodies. So again, when it, there's not a, a human being on the planet who cannot have some lidocaine. There's not a human being on the planet. So again, there are cer certain people who shouldn't have carbocaine. Uh, people with uh, this blood disorder, methemia, uh, globulinemia. I don't even know how, how to pronounce it. But the bottom line is lidocaine with 100,000 epinephrine, uh, virtually anyone can have it. So if I hear you correctly, you just said Novocaine and Mepivacaine are evil and the dentists who use it should be killed? That's that, it. Okay. Yes, along with the uh, people who place amalgam. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the, the dentists have uh, uh, um, amazing minds. Uh, you know, the, the, they'll tell you that their, their sundries is too high. And I'll, I'll go in there, I'm going to go back to amalgam for a second, or, or, or septicane to lidocaine, and they'll say, well, how, how do you get my sundries down? And, and they think the answer is going to be, um, you know, getting online and buying their supplies on a website, you know, having someone sit on a computer for five hours, being paid $20 an hour to save uh, 12 cents on gauze. And it's like, well, a barrel, a barrel of bonding agent is about a million and a half dollars. So why don't you just, on just ugly, fat, bald men, on molars only, switch to amalgam? Oh, no, I don't want to do that. Okay, you're using a very expensive, brand new, brand name anesthetic. We can cut that cost in half using something that's been around uh, since Fred Flintstone. Now nah, I want to use the other one. I mean, it's like, um, they, I mean, every time you put a decision in front of them, you know, low cost, high cost, they pick high cost, and then they complain about their overhead. Warren Buffett said it ama amazingly. Warren Buffett said that 95% of CEOs go to work every day and just try to figure out how they can make their overhead go higher. You know? Um, the same thing now with these kids coming out of school. They They... They're, they're $250,000 in student loans, and they just complain about it all day long, but they think they're not going to be successful without a $75,000 laser, a $100,000 CBCT, and a $150,000 CAD CAM, and I can give them the names of a 1,000 dentists that do a million dollars a year and take home $400,000 that don't have any three of those machines. That's me. Yeah. I mean, right. I mean and, and a lot of that is because so many, I mean, uh, it's, it's, I don't even yeah, know where I, to begin. I remember when someone said, oh, you can't be successful unless you have an intraoral camera, one of those wands or something for intraoral camera, because you have to show people this is what you have and this is what you need. You want to blow it up on a big screen. And I never had one, and I was very successful. So uh, the point is, though, too, that can't, don't patients trust you? Do you have to show them on this big – if anything, I think that might – make the patient a little hesitant to show them on the big screen or something like that, as opposed to here, here's a mirror. Here's my mouth, Mary. See, see that? Something yeah, like but, that. But admit it though. If you went to a gastro, uh, a proctologist and he said he had to remove a, a growth, um, wouldn't you want him to stick a camera up your butt so you could see it first before he went up to remove it? And, and then wouldn't you want to take it home in a jar after it was removed? I mean, that's uh. Oh yeah. I always watch a video of my colonoscopies. You, you know, uh, um, the funny thing, uh, the funny thing about, um, um, you know, if they say like, I'm allergic to Novocaine, you know, that, that's your, and you just pat him say, okay, that's fine. I will never use Novocaine on you. You don't have to tell them that you don't have it in your office and no one buys it anymore or whatever. Just, just keep, right. just keep patting their shoulder and making eye contact. The reason guys like you and me are successful is not because of some toys, because we can relate and communicate to the patient. We have empathy. We have listening skills. When they talk, we repeat, you know, we, we, we nail it on all the soft stuff. And what dentists don't want to hear is they, they want to hear that they buy a, a, a magic bullet for six figures, they'll be successful. And, and 
And the reason you're successful is because you're a communicator. You're talking, you're likable, you're nice, you're trustworthy, loyal, friendly, obedient, courtesy, thrifty, everything the Boy Scouts told us. I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you about them, my amalgam deal. Um, they, um, when people come in, they say, you know, they don't want a silver filling, they want all natural. I would say, well, actually, the all natural one is the silver filling because, see, um, all the elements were formed in exploding supernovas. You know, when the stars collapsed and exploded, that's when you, they made mercury, silver, zinc, copper, and tin. And it's all natural. These tooth-colored fillings are all made by man-made ingredients. They're all made in laboratories by men in white coats and everything. So the, the all-natural filling comes from an exploding supernova. You don't want some chemicals made by men in lab coats. <laughs> That is funny. Let that remind. Let me read you some of the ingredients of composite resin. So yeah, people yeah, say, "Oh, they're yeah. natural. It's non-toxic," which is false. Yeah. Here, here are some of the ingredients: benzyl alcohol, benzyl methacrylate, two six di t butyl four methyl phenol, ethylated bisphenol A dimethacrylate, Bowen monomer isopropylidin bis two hydroxy three four phenoxy propyl methacrylate and there's a list that goes on and on you I, can, know, I know i know you can find that on the on the article i know and, the, and they say that's all natural right right it's yeah absurd. that's all natural never mind it took a man with a phd and 40 colleagues to figure this shit out and make it in a tube and sell it to you never, never and, and never mind that it costs one and a half million dollars a barrel never mind that it lasts half as long as amalgam because you know that 10 year old little boy in your chair ricardo you know that that mod molar that no one's ever going to see your entire life, you know you could put it in for half the cost and it'll last twice as long. And I think amalgams last longer because look, look at the hygienists. They, they like stannous fluoride. That's tin. Tin ions, antibacterial. Tin ions are flying out of amalgam. Silver. I mean, silver. Uh, uh, what do the pediatric dentists used to put underneath the, the filling? Silver. Uh, oh, I, I don't that, know. That, that antibacterial stuff. Silver. Uh, but but anyway, sil silver has been anti has anti every ingredient in amalgam has antibacterial bacterial static properties and then and because I can tell you this I know um, people say well you know where's the study for that I always say well where's the study that if you don't wear a parachute you die I mean I want to I want a randomized right. controlled study where a hundred men are thrown out and half randomly does not have a parachute and half does have a parachute I, I want to see the research that proves right. that you die without a parachute. There's no double-blind, randomly controlled study on parachuting. You know what I mean? They're right. Well, there are studies showing that, that amalgam does have anti, or possibly mercury has anti-caries properties. So, yes, there are studies. There certainly are comparative studies showing that uh, amalgam has a lower incidence of caries than uh, composite resins. But I will tell you this, from being in the last 20 years, when an amalgam has recurrent decay underneath it, usually, you know, it's just a little bit, um, the, the tooth gets hard fast. But when I have an MOD composite and it's only six and a half, seven years old and they come in the eye office and you take that out, you're taking out oatmeal mush with a number four round burr. I mean, it just, the, the tooth, it, it just intuitively, um, you know, what, what I'm seeing is um, I'm just seeing that these bacteria, nothing was slowing them down. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 but, 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 and, and the, the white filling companies, they, they get it. I mean, I was, I had lunch with, uh, Bob Ganley, the CEO of, um, Ivoclair, and their holy grail is to put an, an antibacterial ingredient in, uh, in white composite fillings. I mean, he, he said that's, that, that's like the number one thing they want. They, they, they want to come out with a bacterial static filling. I mean, they, they, they totally, uh, they get it. I think Bob Ganley's a, an amazing man. Um. So uh, um, what else did you want to talk about? Uh, well, I, related to what we were talking about uh, a, a little bit ago was I, my dad had a really good advice to me, I think, which was he don't, didn't want to be the first to jump on a new technology, but he didn't want to be the last either. And I think that's good advice because, like you say, some of these dentists who are jumping on to every type of new technology, and then they basically are just collecting dust after a few years, like, the, like those intraoral cameras with the wands or whatever, I think. Very few dentists use those anymore, I think. Uh, but that, that kind of thing and that kind of thinking, you, you don't necessarily want to be the first, but don't want to be the last. Now, don't get me wrong. My dad was ahead of his time. He was the first guy in Delaware to do uh, implants. You know, used to go up to New York and see Leonard Linkow or something, lecture on the weekends and, uh, 
and because he hated dentures so much, his patients hated dentures. And uh, I remember he, he used triple trays for, for Crown and Bridge. And I brought from some triple trays into dental school with me. And, uh, you know, the professors were like, oh, you're not allowed to use them and all this, you know, it's just so funny. And implants, implants were a crime, you know, in dental school. Now, of course, they're a standard of care. So, so he was ahead of his time, but he wasn't necessarily the very first to uh, jump onto a, a lot of new technologies. And, and I think that's related to what you're saying. I don't, I don't think these kids, you know, one of the things I like about doing podcast, I feel guys like us that have made it, you know, half a century, it's part of our duty to, to keep history alive. I mean, I don't think these kids realize that when I was in dental school, the one oral surgeon that was doing implants, every instructor whispered in your ear. They called him the butcher. Oh, yeah, he, what, the guy is crazy. He's putting metal ramus bars and subperiosteals, and he should have his. They were. They would say he should have his license anyway. He was a butcher. He was, and some of the earliest implant pioneers would do, <coughs> you know, hundreds of full mouth rehab cases, and then the first one that failed, the local board would take their license away. Yeah, terrible. I mean, it's just. I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, terrible. I mean, I mean. So yeah, I mean, I I I've lived through this when I've lived through where. In college, if you went out and drunk beer and Jack Daniels and wrecked the car and got in a fist fight, everybody just like, well, they're boys. But if they smoke pot, they threw them in jail. Right. You know, um, um, if they were gay, uh, you could go beat them up and then go to church on Sunday and be fine. Now they can get married. I've lived through implants being butchery to now state of the art. I mean, it's amazing how things just change and get better if you just give it enough time. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes, when, these young, when these young kids are telling me all the problems in the world, I'm like, I had an argument with the kid the other night. He's talking about, well, our generation, you know, the, our grandparents' generation, they were such anti-environmentalists. And it's like, dude, when, you know, they were, they were trying to fight, you know, Germany and Japan. When, when you're trying to build tanks and jeeps to save a world war, you're not worrying about, you know, what you're dumping in a creek at a tadpole. You know, they were worried right. about Adolf Hitler, not a tadpole or a spotted owl. You know, and, and it's a luxury for you to not have Nazi Germany in your face, to sit there and worry about the environment. You know what I mean? Just, you know, yeah. so, so don't judge people when you weren't there in the right time. But uh, um, you know what? I am, um, you, um, you're, you're, you've talked about so many things, uh, artificial joints, local anesthetics, anticoagulants. Um, uh, I want to, osteoradio necrosis, amalgam versus composite. Um, you know, these guys are listening to this on a podcast. Man, I wish you would put that lecture online. That way, if, if, in Dentaltown, we put up uh, 350 courses. They've been viewed over half a million times. But for your literature mind, it would just be, you know, if, if you had a PowerPoint to, you know, to upload those slides so they can see this exact research. I, I think, I think um, if you put up a course, Medical Myths of Clinical Dentistry, um, it would just be phenomenally important and powerful and any any chance you could ever do that someday sure sure I, i'd be happy to consider something like that yeah, yeah. and uh, like like i say i i uh i say in my lectures i had a professor named dr i am pretentious and you know <laughs> I was, he came over and i was about to do this uh occlusal uh, uh resin or something on on a patient and but he comes over oh my god and he looks at the health history oh my god before you see this patient you have to do a a, a a uh, CBC, a, a PT, a, a, and a DNC, or something like that. You know, and, and get a physician consultation stat. You know, and uh, it just—it's just so absurd. But Doc, I'm just doing an occlusal resin. You know, what's the what's the big deal? You know, and so uh, and uh, that that brings up another issue too: the physician consultation in dental school. I was taught, well, if you don't know what to do, just call up the physician and do whatever the physician says. Then you're safe. Then you won't get sued where they come up with these ideas is just beyond me. Now, first of all, if you're a lawyer and you're going to sue someone because of some bad uh, happenstance and uh, let's, say, um, let's say they had a reaction to a drug that the dentist prescribed but the physician said it was okay. Now, the lawyer, is the lawyer going to sue the physician? Yes. Check that. Now, the dentist has malpractice insurance too. He has a million dollars malpractice insurance. Is the lawyer going to sue the dentist too or is the lawyer going to say, well, the dentist asked the physician what to do. The physician said to do this, so we'll just sue the physician. Or would the lawyer lose his, his law license if he did not sue the dentist? Of course he's going to sue the dentist. He's going to sue everyone. He's going to sue the hospital. He's going to sue everyone. So, of course, everyone's going to get sued. Now, physician consultation does not protect you. In fact, one of the leading causes of malpractice suits against physicians 
is guess what? Physician consultation. That's one of the leading causes of it. So you're asking, it's, I use the, the blind versus the blind. Whereas you're asking, you don't know exactly what to do. Well, this person had a bypass, a heart bypass. I don't know if I should uh, premedicate or not. I don't know what the American Heart Association says. So therefore, I'm going to call the physician, okay? Now, granted, the, the, the patient was, was smart enough to pick you, the best dentist in Phoenix, Howard. He was smart enough to do that. But is he smart enough to pick the best physician in Phoenix? Or could he pick someone who, who's a quack? Maybe he picked a quack. So you're going to call up the physician. Maybe he's a quack, maybe not. And you're going to say, well, doc, I, I don't really know what to do. This person has had a heart bypass uh, operation. So what should I do? Okay, well, for that, you should prescribe, um, you know, penicillin V, 500 milligrams, four times a day, a week before the procedure and a week after. Okay, so then go ahead. You go ahead and prescribe that. Meanwhile, the patient has an anaphylactic reaction. Whose fault is that? Well, take a look at your dental license. Does it say on there, this is a license to defer dental treatment decisions to, to non-dentists, especially if they're physicians? Does it say that? No, you are responsible for the dental treatment decisions. That is a dental treatment decision, whether or not to premedicate someone. The American Heart Association is clear. You should not premedicate people with a uh, heart bypass. And if you do, then certainly there's a different dosage than the one I described. So, you know, who's going who's gonna to win that to? Uh, it's, I mean, it's a no-brainer. You're going to lose. Maybe the physician will lose too, but there, there's no way you can defend that. So I'm not, I'm not saying don't consult with physicians if you need some information, but if, if you already have the information you need, consulting with a physician is not going to help you. It, the American Heart Association is clear on when to premedicate and when not to, and it's endorsed by the American Dental Association. Do you want to go with the American Heart Association or do you want to go with an individual physician who may be a quack? You don't know. So generally, if you need information, now whether the patient has a particular heart condition, whether the patient had endocarditis in the past, patient may not know that. Okay, well, maybe I don't know. I had something wrong with my heart. I don't know what it was. Okay, you can call the physician. Did the patient have endocarditis? The physician says yes. And uh, sh now I wouldn't ask the physician, should I premedicate for that? I would say, should I follow the American Heart Association statement for premedication? And then, you know, let the physician say yes or no, that's fine. But I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recommend that anyway and let the patient make the ultimate decision. But that, that's just one example. And there's other examples of physician consultation as well. If you have a patient on an anticoagulant, uh, generally, you should leave the patient on the life-saving drug, like Coumadin, for example. Leave the patient on the life-saving drug because when they go off that drug, they have atrial fibrillation or something, they're at a, a much higher risk of stroke or heart attack. And there have been many cases where the patients have been taken off these drugs for a short period of time and gotten a stroke or a heart attack. And, uh, you know, which would you rather have, a stroke or some bleeding after a dental extraction? Which would you rather have? I, I say it's bleed or die. So if you call the physician, now does the physician know what, um, what an extraction is and how much bleeding is involved with an extraction and ha how we control bleeding? Does the physician know it? Know that? Of course not. Does the physician think that a root canal is a bloody mess? Yes. Who knows more about dentistry? A physician with 15 years of, of training after high school or 20 years or whatever, does a physician know more about dentistry or does an 18-year-old dental assistant know more? Who would you trust more knowing what uh, a root canal is? I would trust the 18-year-old dental assistant. Why are we asking physicians uh, opinions for something they know nothing about? No, the, the answer for that is if the patient is on the proper dose of Coumadin and they have the proper level, then you go ahead and do the uh, extraction or, or multiple extractions or alveoplasty, whatever you're doing. Leave the patient on the life-saving drug. If they have a little bit more bleeding, we can control that. We're lucky in dentistry. We have ways of control. We can uh, have a patient bite on gauze. We can, have the, we can suture the, uh, the wound if needed. We're not like a general surgery where they got to cut open the patient if there's bleeding. They got to go back in. It's not like that. In dentistry, we're right there. We're right there. So we want to leave patients on life-saving drugs and be, be very, very cautious before you consult with a physician. So did you know if you're on Coumadin, you can't eat green vegetables? Supposedly, yes. That, that's, I want to get on Coumadin. I, I want to be able to go, no, I'll pass on the salad. Just give me a double helping of mashed potatoes. I'm on Coumadin. Well, can, you, can you call me in some Coumadin so I can just quit all the leafy green vegetables the rest of my life? 
There you go. Luckily, uh, coumadin is kind of on the way out. There, there's these newer anticoagulants that are that are coming in, and they're and they don't have those restrictions. I, I used to remember. Uh, um, also, these young kids don't remember back in the day, but I got out of school in in '87, uh, and that's when um, um, David um, Bergal- Kimberly Bergalis in Florida said that she contracted AIDS from her dentist. Remember, yes. remember that deal? That's right. And so I was having patients coming in, and everybody's talking about it. he didn't sterilize his handpiece, and they were saying. Uh, uh, you know, every time they'd ask me, and from it was about from eighty-seven to ninety-five, I used to get at least uh, one out of a hundred little old lady grandmas would say, "Doctor Fran, do you do you sterilize your your hand your drills?" And I'd say, "Well, of course I do, but why do you ask?" And they'd say, "Well, I, I'm concerned about AIDS." And I'd say, "Well, AIDS is a sexually transmitted disease, and I have you scheduled for a filling." And then I would open my drawer and I said, "And I, I do this," I, and my sister would just die. I'd pull out a condom. I said, but if you feel safer, if I have a condom on when I do this filling, my policy is if you put it on me, I'll wear it. And oh, I hand her, and she couldn't, they couldn't even touch it. Their hands would go up. Oh, and they'd God, say, that must have been hilarious. Is that a real condom? And I'm like, yes. And, you know, if you feel safer, if your dentist is wearing a condom, you know, I'll, I'll wear it as long as you put it on. I'm not putting it on. You put it on. That is and, hilarious. Uh, and yeah, they just, um, I love the way you've always stood up. The bullshit. I mean, they, I mean, it is. You, you always, have, you, you. Oh, and by the way, how do, how do you keep your mind on top of all this stuff? I'm sure a lot of kids are riding to school right now. I mean, going to work right now. They're 25 years old. They're commuting into their dental office. They're saying, what? How does he know all this? How does he stay up on it? What, what is your natural behavior to stay on top of all this elite information? Well, I, I do read a lot of the. Uh, of- medical and dental journals. I don't necessarily get a journal and read it cover to cover. I don't at all, but I'm interested in certain topics. You can do a Google search or you can do a Medline search. You can bring up a lot of articles. And nowadays you don't even really have to go to a library. I mean, you got everything online and, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm on the staff at the local hospital. So I've got access to pretty much any medical journal or, or dental journal I want instantly. And if, if in the rare case, they don't have a particular dental or medical journal, then they will get it for me, you know. So, and why are uh, why are you on staff at a local hospital? I uh, I imagine what 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 percent oh. of dentists do you think are on staff at a hospital? Oh, uh, I I don't know. Maybe in Delaware, maybe thirty <laughs> percent or something. But we have a general we have a general practice residency there, so we have a dental pro, a dental clinic at the hospital, and I just go in like half a day a month or something like that to the clinic, help out the uh, the residents, and and that's why. But, I, bet, I bet you're their favorite dentist. <clears throat> I oh, do you pre- have to be. I you do, have to be. I do preface everything I say. That's funny you say that. I preface everything I say. Now, look, I'm going to give you my opinion, but, but please ask the other dentist too. You'll, I'm, not, you know, I'm not saying that I'm in the majority here, but this is what I think you know, about this particular case or that case or something like that. This is what works for me or something. But, uh, but you know, if you're on your dental school or whatever, you can – get a library, but you don't even have to be on, on, on a, a dental school faculty. You can just, uh, whatever I, you're interested in, whatever topic you're interested in. It, nowadays, it's so easy. Just go on online and, and uh, read up on it. And I'm very interested in, in a lot of different topics, and that's what I do. I, I, I think we should reminisce, you know, when, when, whenever someone uh, emails me or messages me on Dental Town, you know, I love your podcast, you know, because um, uh, the views have exploded. I always reply back, What's your demographics? You know, I'm trying to look for their age, and they're all, I mean, it's, it's basically 30 and under. I mean, really. Right. I mean, every time, you know, 29, 27, 24, you know, it's just nobody has ever replied back, you know, as, as old as me. I, no one's ever emailed me as old as me that listens to my podcast. So, but um, I want us to reflect about the, a story 25 years ago when Reader's Digest uh, took study models and x-rays, and they went to about 25 different dentists. And they, they published an article, Is Your Dentist Ripping You Off? And what, what, what I think the succinct point is that if you take records to 25 different dentists, you're going to get 25 different opinions. I still see that on Dental Town. I still see people posting an x-ray or, 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 or photos, and, and you get all over the board. So, um, is, so I got to ask you, you're the most scientific-minded dentist I know. You're the most critical thinker I know. Is dentist... What percent of dentists is art versus science? How, what, how much of it is my opinion and culture and tradition and religion versus math and gravity and physics and geometry? Well, I, I don't know if I know how to answer that other than you should try to use as much science uh, in your practice of dentistry as possible. 
Uh, well, well let, me, let, me, let me ask it this way. If, if someone came in, say grandpa came in and he's 65 years old and he hadn't been to the dentist in 10 years, and you sent him to 10 different dentists in Delaware, would all those treatment plans be the same? No. How many treatment plans would you get on grandpa if he went to 10 different dentists? At least nine, probably. I know. So, so, yeah. so, 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 you, so to these young kids, don't believe everything you hear. You know, this isn't, this isn't, uh, dentistry is still, it'll probably be a thousand years before we just know everything about dentistry. Yeah. And, and, and there's so many different opinions floating out there. And it seems like the ones who get on the lecture circuit and have the most bullying type personality try to shove these things down your, your uh, face and critical minds like you, you, you never, you never blinked. Yeah. Yeah. You, you never blinked. Yeah, well, thank you. You're very kind. Uh, uh, it's, it's fun. And, and, you know, I don't, you know, I'm like you, how I, regardless of what the topic is, I don't just accept whatever I, I hear. I, I like to think, well, okay, that's one, one opinion or that's one way of looking at something. Let's, are there any other ways, uh, you know, and, you know, is amalgam really so dangerous? Are people, are people dropping dead? I, I look at the cemetery. I look at all those tombstones. Is dentistry really that dangerous? Are people in that cemetery killed by dentistry? How many people are there? There's thousand tombstones. Chances are not a single one. Is dentistry really so dangerous? You know, in dental school, we're, we're taught that. We're saying, oh, you got to do a physician consultation because this patient could die from this, that, or the other. They could bleed to death if you, if you leave them on their, their blood thinner. They could, they could get a terrible heart infection. And again, there are a few cases where they should be taking antibiotics, but that's even debatable whether uh, the antibiotic does any good. But they could get a heart infection. You clean their teeth and you didn't take a health history. Oh, my God. You know, so so it's fun to, to, to think, well, do, is that really what people die of? These heart infections from dentistry? You know, the patient had a dental procedure within six months from the uh, heart infection. Therefore, it was the dental procedure. Wait a minute. That's, lots of people had dental procedures in the last six months. It can't be just because they had a dental procedure in the last six months. No, the, the symptoms had to have occur, occurred within two weeks so that the den, it wasn't the dental procedure. We know that. We can rule that out, you know. And so it, it's just interesting to, to think along the lines of, of uh, questioning. Keep but, questioning. But, but, as I, but as I get older, um, so I was uh, heavily involved in getting Phoenix Florida in 89, and then it expired after 20 years. We had to go through the same thing. And, and uh, so I had to, you know, go to debates and in debates on TV and radio and, and blah. And but fluoride so, is poison. I, I know. And, and, you know, and, and now that, you know, when you try to tell them an argument that, you know, fluoride was not made by a fertilizer manufacturer. It was made in a exploding star. Um, it's the 13th most common element of earth. It shows up in the ocean naturally at 1.4 part per million. We're trying to put it in the water at half that amount. You know, you, you, they, they don't want to hear it. And the red flags are, can, they, they're also conspiracy theorists. They're heavily anti-government. I think the whole anti-fluoride has more to do with they just hate all forms of government. And it's like, so you don't like 911, you don't like streetlights, you don't like roads, bridges, highways. You just want, you don't, you don't like order. You just want mass freaking chaos because everyone else is a liar and a cheat and a hack and a steal, but you, you're sacred, holy, and you know, it's just, and, and, and I, 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 it's sad, but <clears throat> at 53 years old, I mean, you start to really realize that the Earth is inhabited by seven billion talking monkeys. I mean, right. uh, you know, they just and and I think one quarter of, of of Phoenix. I mean, this is where I've lived since 1987. I think one quarter of Phoenix doesn't want to hear anything about science or gravity or anything. They just they have their religious beliefs, their anti-government beliefs. Fluoride is toxic. Um, you know, it'll kill you. It was made by fertilizer manufacturers, and there's there's no place. It's so toxic, there's no place to store it, so they bribe the government to slowly pour it into the water oh, because it's God. so toxic. I'm like, okay, th this country has exploded 1,800 nuclear bombs. Couldn't they dump the toxic fluoride there? I mean, you know, couldn't, right. couldn't you dump it where they detonated a, a thermonuclear bomb? I mean, th it's so toxic, they have to pour it in the water. Yeah, because, you know, so so at some point, I mean, the, these people they just they just don't want to have anything to do with science, yeah. or reason or rationale. Um, right. Yeah. So, uh, um, well, I uh, 
I want to thank you for uh, getting up this morning and having an hour with me. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm your biggest fan. I mean, dude, you've, I mean, how many studies, how many papers have you written? Like 60 articles? I mean, I've been a big fan of your stuff. Uh, I would seriously give anything if you condense some of that stuff for a course, uh, Medical Myths, because I, 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 I want dentistry to go down the science path, not the I believe this path and I want this path, but go down a science path. Um, amalgams do last longer. Um, they are a fraction of the price. Uh, lidocaine is less expensive. I mean, there, I mean, you just, I just love your critical thinking, dude. Oh, I'm, I, you. I'm, I'm your biggest fan. And, uh, but, um, anything else you want to close or, uh, well, it's a, it's a pleasure, uh, uh, being here. I, I think, thank you so much for everything you do for dentistry. It's amazing. And th these podcasts are a great idea and the dental town magazine and the, the dental town forums and. How do you have time for it? That's what I'm going to interview well, you. How you, do you, you know have time? what? I, I'm going to ask you a, the, an overtime question because we're at one hour. I'll ask you a question. Um, 28 years out of school watching dentists, trying to see, you know, who's successful, who's not. And by success, I don't mean just money, but, you know, doing, you know, love what they're doing, long-term staff, happy patients that come back, making money for their family, you know. And I'm, I'm trying to say, you know, what do the successful people have that the non-successful do? And uh, the hugest one I see is that they were committed lifelong learners. They took at least 100 hours of continuing education a year. They got their FAGD, their MAG. They were lifelong learners. And when I saw the podcast, I thought, you know, right now, after work, you know, her society has a study club that's like, um, you know, the last Thursday of every month, and she's tired after work, and she's got to drive across town and register and eat a rubber chicken dinner, then listen to a speaker. And, and that, that's her substitute in the marketplace for about one hour. But if I did a podcast, and I did uh, two a day, so she's got an AM hour commute and a PM hour commute, um, I, I'm, I'm going to get 30 study clubs down her a month, you know what I mean? And But but I but I wonder, my critical mind says, well, which came first? Did the 100 hours of CE every year for 20, 30, 40 years make this person a great dentist, or did just great dentists take a lot of CE? I mean, did, did, did the CE make you great or would you just have a great attitude and you would have been great with or without CE? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? It's a good question. Yeah. Because, because being out here in Phoenix, every time I've gone to a CE course, it's the same group of successful dentists and they always bring their staff and the ones I never see at CE always, you know, their practices are coming and going and, you know, they're, they right. fade away. So, so what do you think? You think the CE makes you great or great people take CE? I, I think it's a combination. When you put it that way, I think it's probably a combination. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, we're in overtime. Thank you so much for all that you do. And uh, I look, uh, I hope someday you put a course together because this was so much information that so many people would want to see what you're citing or, or any footnotes or anything that from your uh, presentation. Thanks a lot, Howard. All right. Have a rocking hot day. See you later.